There is a growing awareness among people of the underlying spiritual nature in all things. We all want to unite with the energy that makes and guides the universe, but it is the way we see reality that stops us from learning our true nature and purpose. Our mission is to uncover evidence and explain the mysteries which connect science and spirituality. By seeking out those with remarkable insight who are willing to come forth and disclose valuable information, we hope to find the truth about human potential, what we really are and where we came from. If we answer this, we answer everything. There are those, however, who would not want us to succeed. To begin our journey of discovery, we searched for someone who thinks outside the box, someone who could show us a different way of viewing the world. We found John Hutchison, the discoverer of a collection of strange phenomena known as the Hutchison Effect. We're going to go see John Hutchison, mm -hmm. who has some sort of anti-gravity device. Right, and his whole apartment is built all around these buttons and gadgets and stuff. So how in the world does he make this incredible device in a tiny apartment here in Vancouver? I have no idea. You know what? I think I just found it. Wow. Look at that. That's, That's amazing. amazing. He's got an anti-aircraft gun. He's got a, a generator. He's got a transformer up there. This guy is... A bell, too. This is, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. Wow. Let's go meet him. Yeah, we're going to check this guy out. Yeah. Okay. Or it's right here. It's right there. All right, he's going to come down. There he is. Hey, John. Dear. Hey, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you how doing? How are you? Dominique, nice to finally meet you. Pleasure, ma'am. Hey, I'm Rob. Hi, Rob. How are you doing? Good, good, thanks. That's good to hear. I'm not sure what to expect. How can his laboratory also be his apartment? My intuition tells me that he is sincere and wants to share his discoveries with others. Okay, so this is the laboratory. This is the laboratory. And behind this unusual door, you'll find a lot of unique things. And on the door, of course. Central okay. Intelligence Agency. Yes. I see we're not the first people who've been here. No. There's been a lot of interesting folks that have been here. All right, let's take a look behind let's it. see. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Behind here we go. Number three here. Wow. Look at all these buttons and gadgets. I've never seen anything like this before. On the floor there is an amazing amount of metal samples from yeah. the 1980s experiments. Wow. But I drag them out and There's save time one. by dragging them out that way. Is this gold? Oh, that's actually brass. brass. So this is what happens when the metals are affected by this gravitational field. That's right, yes. Sometimes they'll lift up or they'll turn into jelly or fall apart or actually convert into another unknown alloy. And how long does it take for it to get mushy? It can take a few minutes, sometimes seconds, and it just turns into it looks like a pile of gooey metallic stuff, and it just starts moving around, falls apart, and stays that, stays that way after the machines are turned off. So by changing the frequencies, you can change the effect that it has on these different objects? Pretty well, yes. Yes, if, uh, the heaviest object I levitated was 1,500 pounds, and then another person, another team did it too. In, in the bigger labs. And it's not heat, there's some other process that's going on. Some other process, yeah. working on the atomic level, I believe. Yeah. It's the radio waves and unusual things. You ever put any organic substances on this thing? And Actually, we did. We put our dinners in there one time. <laughs> Let's see what happened. And, well, it tasted good. So you have a toilet here. Yeah, the, the, the throne. She's inspecting it. Oh my goodness grief. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I just... How I, do you do? I sit there and take my vitamins all in one kind of operation. So what's this right here? That's a transmission unit mm -hmm. that I use in some of my experiments. It's a naval piece. And I'll be turning that on a little shortly. How come so much of this stuff is radio gear? Mm, it's all naval radio transmission gear and receiving units. And I use the high voltage and power supplies and that, converting them into usable power like uh, like a Tesla coil has energy. Well, I don't need the sparks, but I just need the energy from the different machines. So most of your stuff is, is ex-military? All ex-military. Mm -hmm. We're talking, what, a million volts, 100 million volts? Oh, no voltage like that. No, that's in the big uh, labs that you tell that, but um, roughly about 20,000, 30,000 volts. Now, some of the stuff looks like oscilloscope. Some of it looks like it's uh, transmitting equipment, receiving two-way equipment. Uh, what we see 
just about everything having to do with radio. Do you need to generate radio signals on all frequencies or just specific ones? I had to do multiband uh, radio frequencies for the experiments, and I, along with that, I also generate electrostatic power. Didn't you get raided by the government? There was a major raid in 1991. Okay, who, who, who raided 1990. you? Uh, right. Government guys, but I was in Europe at the time, so they okay. took the entire 22-ton lab and... But they took all the stuff? All the stuff. Really? Buried it and put it in barrels, and they tried to keep it a secret, but the main newspapers, Vancouver Sun, found out about it and put it headline news. Mm. So all these samples now are, are again, a, a result of your various tweaking of your equipment and, and your experiments. Have you ever had metal uh, uh, just react in a way that perhaps it just disintegrated or exploded or anything like we that? We had large bars of it where the end of it would just simply not explode but just fall apart into a, a soft unknown alloy. John, wow. can you try and show us an experiment? I can show you an experiment which will probably happen within here. What I have in that area, that's another room, a machine room actually, but in the center of it is some of the high voltage equipment and test samples. Mm -hmm. And I got a small video cam to see what I'm doing because I'll be operating all the controls around in here. Yep, that's good. And go way back in the back here and turn on the other machines. Ha ah, ah. We engage certain um, Klystron power supply units. And what I'm doing is adjusting some high voltage in there uh, along with electrostatic energy and RF fields. Go with this guy here. Okay, John, what is that wheel that you turn, that you're turning to, to, to change the energy? What is that? That's actually a phase shifting wheel. Okay. It activates generators in the other room, and I can shift phase negative or positive one way or the other. All right. And I have an indicator system here that shows me up here when I'm doing it, or a, also a, a gauge system where you can probably see it here, negative or positive. If I do it slow, and then I have the, the main one up here. And that engages the what they call variometers. What their variometer is is a coil, and has an inner coil that tilts back and forth a little bit. So the RF frequency or radio waves are then ca caught and manipulated through phase shifting. This unit goes into a CM11, which is a uh, old-style Navy transmitter. Basically, here it's just more or less um, monitoring or running those pieces of equipment. I think I'm doing all right here. I got everything on. Power up the energy here. I'm just gonna rest my hand on this 50 caliber machine gun. Kind of oily. Yeah, okay. I can hear something powering up. That's incredible. Well, that's interesting. Now I take in heat into consideration if there's spark gaps in that, they heat up and the frequencies adjust. So what I try and do is compensate all the time. Okay. And these instrumentations, they help me a little bit on determining that. Nothing's happening. Or overheated a bit. Can't tell from the monitor, but I'll try. I got it cranked to max. Yeah, we've got a spike there, but. Yeah. Oh. Got something levitating in there. It's levitating. Dominique, we're going to shut down now. Okay. Oh. 
John, what we saw was really interesting. You had this canister that seemed to levitate and be spinning. You have, you have things just uh, randomly uh, scattered around and this field could affect them regardless of where they're positioned? Yes, the ra actually the range on the fields is up to 300 feet. It was measured by Los Alamos in 1983. Now, in this apartment, everything is so congested that uh, it affects other people's um, stuff upstairs or next door and that. It is a problem trying to do anything really in, in this confined space. Okay, now this is really interesting. This one here is, um, again, it's um, aluminum bar stock with a kitchen knife that sat on top and floated inside of the metal and we... Floated inside the metal? Yeah. So it was like, this part was melting and then it, it was, it's like it was floating on top of water kind of thing? Kind of like that, and it just sort of fell inside the metal and stuck after we machined it down to expose the actual knife itself. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, the experiments that you're doing here, does that recreate the Hutchinson effect or is that only done at an industrial lab? Well, no, here it's the uh, original Hutchison effect is created, but not on such a dynamic level as in the industrial spaces because of the problem with power. Not enough juice around here. Not huh? enough juice in here. How come the government isn't using this technology to build cars? And instead of using um, gasoline, which pollutes the air, isn't um, there something like free energy that we could use and implement into a vehicle? Oh, there's all types of free energy out there. Yeah. It's known as zero point energy and it's um, pretty well a bona fide energy source. But in the matter of national security, these guys are keeping it to themselves and experimenting in the national laboratories with this technology. Do you think the military is using anti-gravity technology for their aircraft? Oh, for sure. They used the high voltage already years ago for the stealth bomber. Give it an extra lifting power. They cover it in a certain material and then they add high voltage to it and that gives it a hex, kind of an extended wing. Thanks for showing us the, uh, yeah. the equipment. We really had a, a very electrifying time here. Actually, so did I. <laughs> it was a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure, man. Thanks, John. Great. Off to the next adventure we are. Okay, That's sir. right. <laughs> Have fun. Don't get lost out there. could barely move through the narrow spaces in John's apartment. But somehow, he seems to have enough room to generate these high-frequency currents that levitates objects, fuses different materials together, and spontaneously fractures metal. According to John, the Hutchinson effect occurs as a result of combining radio waves and high-voltage sources, such as Tesla coils. If this zero-point energy can be converted into usable power, it's no wonder the military was interested. We needed to find another person involved with zero-point energy. My research led us to Las Vegas, Nevada to a man named Ralph Ring. A gifted and intuitive researcher and developer who helped to build and test pilot flying discs in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Hello. Well, hello. How, are you doing? How are you? Dominique. I'm doing fine. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome to Las Vegas. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for coming. Come on in. Yeah, sure. Welcome to our home. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for taking some time. I'm really interested to talk to you about these flying saucers that well, you have not only been <laughs> building, but flying from what we hear. Yes. Uh, well, uh, we started, uh, at least I started, back uh, in uh, the late 50s and early 60s. We've rebuilt, redesigned them for years after that. We want to uh, now turn them into a, a form of habitation and transportation for people so that they, their home will be their transportation as well. Ralph, by, by we, who do you mean exactly? Oh, okay. Well, I should fill you in on that, I guess. Nikola Tesla was a great inventor and uh, a great, great humanitarian. Well, Tesla wanted to get into his field, which was free, if you will, energy that comes from the surroundings. He was hired by um, J.P. Morgan to work with S, uh, Westinghouse and Edison companies in, in the East Coast. And Tesla says, I've, 
I've got it made. I think we can now transmit electrical power through the Earth, through the ionosphere, without any wires or, or telephone poles. If you gave a device, like a free energy device, a generator that would, would uh, service all their needs in their home for free, they could then bring out their creative talents, which they were born with and been suppressed because they've had to toil for a living. They could be tremendous artists beyond, beyond our dreams, tremendous engineers beyond our dreams. J.P. Morgan was not buying it. He said, no, we're going to have to tear this stuff down. So Tesla kind of pulled back into himself and decided, you know, well, I guess it's not time for this. And, well, at, at that time, he was living in the New Yorker Hotel, actually, in New York. And um, there was a fellow by the name of Otis Carr who he was going to school, and to supplement his, his income, he worked as a clerk in this hotel. And uh, Tesla and him became acquainted, and Carr was a sponge. He loved science in every way, shape, or form, but he was a natural science. He believed in the same thing Tesla did, that there, there's no limits to natural science, and everything should be on a simple level. Tesla said, they're, they're not interested in my, my time. I want you to take everything I can teach you and go in your time and see if they'll listen to you. And if you don't make it, you're gonna have to pass it on because at the rate we're going, we're on a self-destructive course. Carr said, I will, I will. And he, he got his own lab started and, and started uh, uh, really getting into a lot of free energy devices and building them. So he built a spaceship? Mm -hmm. He's building small spaceships then, and uh, he had different sizes, different models. So tell us how you met Otis Carr and how you began working with these flying saucers. There's a company, Advanced Kinetics, in Costa Mesa. That's where we were living, in Costa Mesa, California. And they're looking for a research and development laboratory technician. They gave me a job, they put me in the research lab, and I was inventing ideas all day long. I just loved it because I, I like to invent simple ways of doing hard things. And was, and was Otis Carr working there too? No. I told some friends about, about, about this and what I was doing and he said, well, come to our group. We've got a group here called Understanding. It was created by a, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Fry in California. We could talk about things that were unlimited, not limited. I said, my mission is to see that we have habitation and transportation in, in one vehicle. And he said, well, you, you sound like a guy that's back east getting in trouble right now. His name is Otis Carr. And he put in a patent for a levitation device and they, they wouldn't give him the patent. They had to, he said, you've got to pull that levitation out and anchor it on the ground and we'll give you a patent on an amusement device. You cannot use levitation. They brought him out to California. They said, here's your lab. They, it was all built, it had living quarters, it had uh, you know, machine shops, it had... And that's where you did most of your work, I that's imagine. And this is where you guys worked on the spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to develop this craft? Day and night, 24-7, we were building these small prototypes. And they would range anywhere from uh, 12 inches to three feet to six feet, to, you know, in, in size. And they actually flew, they actually levitated. Oh yeah. Oh, and what sure. was the source of the power? Well, it was magnetic in nature. And, uh, and you were actually easier. building these for people to sit in. I mean, not just models. These were, these were prototypes just to prove uh, what we wanted and then graduate up to where human habitation could, could get on board and, and, and operate. If you could explain to us very simply how this device, how these craft work. In those days, yeah. we had counter-rotating wheels, one going clockwise and another going counterclockwise. We had a capacitor, we had small magnets, and um, we had what's called a utron. It was a double tetrahedron. That's two ice cream cones put with the open ends together so that you have a diamond shape. And we had 12 of them around the periphery of the craft. And we had magnets, horseshoe magnets, 12 of those around the craft. So when you started rotating and counter-rotating, the, as these Utrons went through the field, they would act as, as a generator and a capacitor in, in themselves, and they would generate a lot of power, not necessary electrical power, but vibrational power. When you get to the resonant frequency of your surroundings, uh, it cancels everything out. It goes to a zero point. And once you've reached zero point, then you can go anywhere you want, and you're, you're, you have your own force field around the, the craft. control its up and down and left and right movements by 
how fast it spins or other gyros in there? Yeah, the ones with the models we had, we had uh, remotes, you know, to, to, to operate the models. But <clears throat> when, when you get up into the larger craft, it's not necessary because everything then, as Carr was explaining the difference between the brain and the mind, is synergetic. You operate the craft like it was a friend. It's, it's like it was a living thing. So because you connect with the craft. Yes. And, and that's, that's the only way that our particular craft would work. There was a mental interface? Yes. So it's wow. kind of like yes. the thoughts carry out a vibration as well, mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. go in harmony with the ship. So wow. some sort of morphogenic field was created, perhaps, some sort of almost yes. living field. Yeah, absolutely. Ralph, have you had a chance to fly it yourself? Flying is an, an antiquated word when it comes to the type of spaceships that we were operating because they don't f conventionally fly. More they, levitate. They levitate and they teleport. They move through this thing called time and space. They actually traverse through multi-dimensions. So you created an artificial gravity field, is it safe to say? Uh, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Is this in any way related to the work of John Hutchinson and his anti-gravity experiments? Well, it's along the same lines. I know John, he's, he's an associate of our group. And as I mentioned before, there's all forms of levitation. But where ours differs from John's is that in order to operate our craft, it takes spirit, it takes, it takes a synergy. It, you have to recognize the craft as an entity of, of, of life itself. It has a consciousness, if you will, of its own. What John is doing, is wonderful. I'm glad he's discovered a tremendous field of uh, levitation and, and the composition of, of metal and uh, manicular structures. Ralph, can you tell us about your experience as being the co-pilot of one of these discs? Sure. The next stage up was the 45-foot craft. It was, uh, they had already designed and built it, and uh, <clears throat> they wanted us to test it. So we got on board, and near the center of the craft was a, a giant crystal ball in a kind of a gyroscopic holder. Underneath that was a laser that came up through the bottom of this crystal. And as the light came up and dispersed around this crystal, it lit up the crystal from infrared all the way, way around to ultraviolet. Then then Carr said, okay guys, <clears throat> what I want you to do is just clear your brain and use your mind. So this is an experiment and we're going to go outside and back in through what's known as time and space. And all you have to do is concentrate on what I'm, what I'm about to tell you. We're going to go down range 10 miles. And that 10 miles down range is equated to the vibratory rate of the color aquamarine. The colors just kind of dissolved and started turning into this brilliant aquamarine. And it lit up the whole ship. And then he said, okay, that's it, boys get out of the craft and we're going to debriefing. And we looked at each other like, oh, I don't think it worked. We didn't, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't do anything. And we said, well, it didn't work, did it? They said, why don't you guys empty your pockets? And we started pulling out sticks and stones and grass and stuff and putting them on the table. And I know we didn't have those going in. And where in the heck did this come from? And he said, well, you remember I told you about the brain has a limited capacity. It cannot believe beyond its, its jurisdiction. It doesn't want to believe anything beyond that. So you travel with your mind and, and it will come back to you and then all these dots will be filled in as, as your life progresses. You'll remember what you did. It was in retrospect, <clears throat> I did go back now and I do remember going and getting out of the craft. There was three of us. We walked down this ramp. We got out and we went over to a little hillside. I can see it right now. We picked up rocks and sticks, put them in our pockets, and we got back on board. I remember it now, but I didn't remember it then. It sounds like this technology is something that we have to be spiritually advanced enough to be yes. able to use it. And Carr explained that as higher consciousness. He said, you've got to raise the consciousness. When you were operating this disc, did you notice or were you told that anything changed as far as the structure of the craft? There's a consistent expansion and contraction. It's almost, it's almost so instantaneous that it's unnoticeable. And in one of the smaller demonstrations, <clears throat> we had a, a small model 
uh, aluminum model, and I could hear this hum, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful feeling while this thing was running, and I was touching it, and then it, it got it got more and more intense, and then I found like it was jello, and I could put my fingers on it like jello, and I I looked at the other guys, and then I put my fingers inside this aluminum with my, my hand. I said, this is impossible when I'm doing this. And I put it in, in and out of the craft. And Carr was over there because he said, yeah, they said, yeah, you're energy, and that's energy. And when you understand that and you, you get a harmonic with energy, you get a balance, you can do anything. There's no limit. So the next day, he had another model, and we put it up, but he was going to accelerate beyond. He says, these <clears throat> retinas are like cameras are flashing at milliseconds. And when you flash fast enough, things seemingly disappear. So with that in mind, here's our next demonstration. So we fired this one up and we were all watching it and I was, I was getting ready to put my hand in it and whew, the whole thing disappeared right in front of us. He said, it's quite simple. Tesla did this all the time in his laboratory and it's, it's uh, teleported. He said, well, where did it go? And he said, well, it might have landed on somebody's dining room table. I don't know. He says, I don't know yet where it went. And I don't know if it'll come back. Maybe it'll show up someday. Maybe it's gone. Maybe it's still there. But we just don't see it. So we don't see it, yeah. And we, it's out of our dimension. And he explained <clears throat> that the mind, when you, get, when you tune yourself high enough and you get into the mind space instead of the brain space, instead of logic or instead of reasoning or instead of all those things, you just get up to a sense of knowing. You know who and what you are. That you're a creative, immortal, infinite being. And we all are. And he said, every, everybody on this planet is, is, are gods by comparison. And they don't know it. They're asleep. <laughs> and until they wake up, this is what our job is. We're making these toys, trying to get them to wake up to realize there's no limits to what they can do. They don't have to live in servitude. They don't have to live in poverty. They've just been told that by people that uh, unfortunately want to control things. Carr explained to us <clears throat> that the brain that we have operates this water vessel which we live in. But the energy that inhabits the vessel is who and what we are. We are energy, we're not, we're not bodies. The energy is all magnetic in nature. It's free in nature. We're swimming in energy. Well, before we could get any further with it, we were uh, invaded, if you will, by um, people with a piece of paper that said they were at this time closing us down. The paper read that we were attempting to overthrow the monetary system of the United States and that could be construed as high treason and we were shutting you down and confiscating all your equipment. Wait a minute, didn't John Hutchison say the same thing about the Canadian government? That they confiscated his entire lab at one time? I stayed in touch with Carr as much as I could, but uh, as soon as I contacted him, I was contacted by somebody. We told you to stay away from even thinking about this. Well, what did the energy companies do to Carr? The uh, powers that be, uh, namely the power companies weren't quite interested in anything that to do with Tesla or car. They didn't want this information out. It was even beyond the energy company. It was behind, it came down to, and it can be traced to this day, back to the international banking system out of England. That's where this all started, the monetary system per se. Because his inventions were so revolutionary, would it upset the whole banking system? <clears throat> yes, it would upset everything. They had a very, very, uh, earnest effort put forth to, to eliminate Carr and his, and his inventions and his ideas. Ralph, do you think you're going to build models again? We're doing it now. We have pods related to research facilities all over the United States because I'm getting a lot of help, a lot of support. And there's people like me, people more brilliant than me that are involved in it. And we're waiting not for the uh, the crafts because they're they're waiting in the wings the crafts are ready now but we're waiting for the consciousness of the people to raise up high enough and to start accepting these gifts that we want to give to them well hopefully that's changing and hopefully in time we'll see people flying around in these crafts yeah, absolutely of yours. we're going from the uh, flintstones to the jets yeah, ralph absolutely. thanks so much for talking to us today well, you're quite welcome. extraordinary it's been my pleasure
So the Hutchinson effect and the work of Ralph Ring and Otis Carr, if controlled, are capable of providing free energy to the world, which according to Mr. Ring is what Nikola Tesla had always envisioned for humanity. I need to find out more about Tesla and the origins of zero point energy. I'm therefore taking a detour to West Palm Beach, Florida, while Dominique stays behind to do some research and determine our next guest. In Florida, I'll be interviewing a man named Jeff Pahari, the curator of the turn of the century electrotherapy museum. He should have more insight into what Tesla was and on his inspiring work. Hey, Ralph. Welcome to my little Tesla museum. Hey, great to be here. Thanks Come so much for letting me in. Yep. What an interesting place you've got here. Look at all this stuff. This is incredible. Now, this looks like it is not very current. I mean, well, this stuff dates back, what, to the early 1900s? Most of these machines are 1890s to the early 1900s. 1900s. Right. Uh, 1920s being about the latest here. And how would you describe all the stuff? Is this, are these all Tesla coils? They're all Tesla coils. They're all uh, in adaptations of Tesla's patents in some way, uh, normally made for medical use. All right. And of course, Tesla is the inventor of the Tesla coil, but what did he originally invent it for? Originally, he was looking into a new way of generating high voltage. He was looking for a new way of distributing energy. It was part of his early alternating current experiments. So he was looking for a way to create energy, to process energy, and how to distribute it. Right. So you have quite a bit of medical devices here. What else do you have that's along these therapeutic lines that Tesla was working on? Well, they started off with the x-ray machines, mm -hmm. and one of the first things they discovered was that uh, they thought initially x-rays were curing people of a lot of problems. and. Then afterwards, they found that some of the tubes weren't working properly and that they attributed that maybe the electricity was what was curing some of them in some cases. And it goes back to an initial experiment of, of someone trying to cure a patient of blindness. And they noticed if you x-rayed someone that was blind, they would see flashes. One of the early patients had remarked that uh, during all of the different treatments with different tubes, her migraines completely went away. And the doctor ended up attributing it to the machine because that was the only constant. All of the tubes he used were different. And, and, and so that was kind of the birth of electrotherapy from a, a Tesla coil point of view. And they went on to develop uh, these surgical machines. And by the 20s, they were the most humane form of, of surgical tool available because you could cut and cauterize tissue and, and uh, especially with cancer, you could remove cysts without reinfecting other parts of the body. You were able to precisely cook and cut as if you had a laser. So these were actually used to perform surgery on people? Right. Using high voltage instead of a scalpel? Right, exactly. There were tools such as this that could connect to those machines and, and you can regulate a, a spark length and literally plunge into tissue or cut around it. Remove what you wanted and leave what you wanted left alone, left alone. Sounds like something out of Star Trek. Yeah, it, it is. But how old is that? We're talking, what, over 100 years? This is 1920. And this, this had the advantage with Tesla coils. As you were cutting tissue, it would actually seal the blood vessels so there wouldn't be excessive bleeding involved. So, and, and many times it meant life and death for someone that was being operated on. So how is it that Tesla began experimenting with energy in a way in which that no one else before him did. He found that by resonance, he could obtain voltage uh, regardless of the turn-to-turn -turn ratios in the coils. And that means in English? That means that you could take a small amount of wire and get a lot of voltage. There you go. And at the same time, the voltage was relatively safe to handle. And there were other effects they found with it, such as heating uh, of the body and different physiological effects on tissues. So you have some examples over here of how Tesla technology was used for healing even close to 50 years ago. Right. Yeah, these, these are incredible. These are the violet rays. Right. Yeah, show me some of these. These are, these are really wild. Here's an early example. It was made by the Renew Life Company of Chicago. All right. And it was basically a handheld Tesla coil. All right. You could plug different glass electrodes made for all parts of the body imaginable and then a few unimaginable. So there's a little Tesla coil in here. Right. All right. And then you would take whatever piece that you wanted, whichever one would fit whatever body that you were trying to heal, you put it in here. Exactly. Okay. 
and these would normally light up inside and, yeah. and the sparks would be transmitted through them and you could treat your face or... You could adjust the, uh, the power there? You could adjust the intensity and some of them even come with ozone generators that you could inhale the ozone. Good lord! And Was that healthy? To a certain extent, but uh, with these machines you can knock yourself out, out if you're not careful. Yeah! That would, that would do the trick, wouldn't it? And were these popular back then? Or? There were literally hundreds of thousands of these manufactured. Good lord. So it's, it's people say, what are Tesla coils used for? Or were they ever commercialized? It's a prime example. Wow, extraordinary. And you've got a, quite, a, quite a number of them. Well, we've had, I estimate at one point, over 200 machines. 200 different models. Yeah, right. Okay, so these are all the different types of models that were put out. These are a few examples. Yeah. So, Jeff, you have some working models of Tesla coils. Can you show me what they look like when you fire them up? Right. This is, uh, this is one of the, the best examples we have. It was made by a company called Fisher. Right. And it was actually a portable x-ray machine. You could just attach a tube to here. Yeah, let's fire this thing up. See what we'll do. Believe it or not, this is what an, an average Tesla coil would have looked like built by Tesla. You can see a kind of... So how many volts was that? That's around 250,000 volts. 250,000. So you have a lot of different Tesla coils here, and they all do their own thing, don't they? Right. Well, show me a few more, because I'm anxious to see other Tesla coils doing different things. Sure. OK. Wow, what's that? That's an ozone generator that uses Tesla technologies. So does this thing still work? Is this something that you've made? or? Yeah, I've made this one here. Uh, mm. It can still be fired up. Um, you don't see much of a of a spark from it, but... We'll get some ozone, though, won't in, we? in the dark, yeah. if you attach some wires to it, you can actually light up a room by... Uh, this is actually the, the electric uh, effluves produced by this machine in the dark. So you can actually use it as a light source. Probably yeah. not the most efficient light bulb ever, but it would work. Right. <laughs> Hit 50,000 volts. All right, yeah, let's uh, turn it on, see, see, see what it'll look like there. You really smell the ozone. It infiltrates the room quickly. You can't see much of a spark from it, but in the complete darkness, the, the whole of the air turns violet. So how did you get started investing all your time and energy into this? Well, I was always a pack rat. And when I was still in school, I was at a flea market and found this machine and had no idea what it was. I brought it home. I plugged it in and started making noise and humming. And the TV started flashing across the room. But I better unplug the TV before I damage something. So rather than plug the strange device, you figured I better unplug the TV. Right. And when I got to the TV, I found someone had already unplugged it. So the TV was making sounds and, and the tube was flashing a bit. And to me, it was something like outer space. And so I had to learn more. <laughs> so the TV wasn't even on. Right, the TV wasn't even plugged in. So you have a few others here. It looks like they do similar things. What, what does this one do here? This in particular was a coil that they found in the early days of radio. Of course, Tesla is now credited with the invention of radio over Marconi, but they found that the Tesla coils could be used as a power supply for wireless telegraphy. And Tesla had bigger dreams in this as far as transmitting electrical energy without wires. But the, the first practical results were radio signals. Really? And this is a reproduction I built of, a, of a, such a machine. How many volts is that? That's a, about 150,000 volts. So this would have been used for a power supply for a radio? Right. It, actually a radio transmitter. So do Tesla coils actually give off radio frequencies as well? Correct. They, they generate a, a wide range of radio frequencies. I mean, there's so much different types of electricity. I mean, there's, uh, there's static electricity, you know, there's right. electromagnetic. Do you have any things that demonstrate the different types of, of uh, electricity? Well, there's a, a small machine here. This is actually one that was built to, to simulate static electricity. We don't have a proper platform here, but it, it would actually make your hair stand on end, similar to a, a Van de Graaff machine. Really? But uh, with much more powerful 
and it consumes about 100 watts of electricity. It's more than my stereo. Over 100,000 volts out of it. Uh, this type of machine, the output can be regulated to produce almost DC, where you could charge Leiden jars or do experiments like Ben Franklin was doing 100 years earlier, only a much more simplified method. So we know electricity can make things spin and turn and flip. How about levitate? Is there any connection between these high voltages and making objects actually lift off the ground? Uh, there are eddy current effects that, that you can use with Tesla-type circuits where you can have a a large electromagnet with an iron core and place something like an aluminum ring on top. And the, the ring will act like a short circuit of a, of a wire of a transformer and you can actually send these rings into the ceiling if, if by accident. I mean, steel you can use an electromagnet and pull materials out, but if you have brass and aluminum mixed together, it's harder. These high frequency currents can actually cause them to lift up and where you could separate them in a way for recycling materials or reclaiming materials. So Jeffrey, what's this? It looks like something we saw in the other office there. Uh, this is a the prototype I built specifically as a, a new modern use for a Tesla coil. Really? And it's basically there's a craze today to find a, a portable x-ray machine that's practical. And uh, they're actually going back to the early Tesla technologies with the high frequency coils. And the problem is because the, the technology is so far removed, they're using modern electronics to try to do it, and they, they end up with these machines that are 100 pounds and that don't work that great compared to the, the tra traditional styles. So here's a, an example of uh, an actual, built with modern materials, but uh, using turn of the century methods, an, a portable x-ray machine or a power supply for an x-ray tube. Well, yeah, let's take a look. So what you're saying is that there is a need for having portable x-ray equipment to take into combat, say? Right. Yeah. One, one of the things interesting, the tsunami, there were, there were so many victims, they, how, how are they going to identify the victims on location? And, and you can use dental records, and oh, the problem right. was how do you get x-ray machines into, into the field, into rubble, yeah. more or less. Right. And you can run this off of a, of a series of batteries. Right. Right. You could, if you wanted, you could run it off of a computer battery backup, even a small one. Now, of course, if this was part of an X-ray machine, it wouldn't be a big spark that way. But you would use that energy to drive the uh, the X-ray tube. Right. You would have a regular X-ray tube head connected instead of those spark terminals. Right. This is absolutely extraordinary. The stuff you have here is, in some way, very old technology. But in other ways, it's still cutting edge. Right. And it, as technology changed, a lot of these machines, they're they kind of got forgotten. There, there's many new fields, uh, as Tesla had envisioned uh, initially, that could still be explored. Yeah, for, for therapy, you know, for uh, communication, uh, for transmitting electricity through the air. Right. Wasn't there a report that just came out that talked about MIT scientists using this kind of technology? Right, someone, someone was lighting a bulb from a, a few feet away, and it's something that Tesla was doing a few hundred feet away. Just sending electricity the through the air? Through the air and then through ground waves also. So there's really no limit to where this technology can take us in the future, is there? I, I think uh, when we go back to the beginning, it's, it's endless what we can do. Yeah. Jeff, what an adventure. Thanks so much for showing me this stuff today. Oh, thanks for stopping by. I gotta run now, but let's talk again. Okay, anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Nikola Tesla once said, to cause at will the birth and death of matter would be man's grandest deed, which would give him the mastery of physical creation, make him fulfill his ultimate destiny. He believed that we have the power to create anything. He taught his protege, Otis Carr, that. Otis Carr then reveals this message to Ralph Ring, and John Hutchison follows in their footsteps. They were all inspired by Tesla to experiment with zero-point energy and evolve their higher consciousness. 